This is a lecture for my uh, third hour class on the 4th of May. Uh, we're talking about xenophobia for the first time in history in the 1920s. We limited immigration. Uh, the government decided we're going to wait. We're not going to let any more new people in. We're going to wait until these people are assimilated, until they become part of American culture, the immigrants we have now, and then we'll let others in. In 1924, uh, the Immigration and Immigration Restriction Act uh, was passed. Uh, it's also a great, the 20s is a great period of fear. Uh, fear of communism. The Great Red, we talked about this yesterday, the Great Red Scare is going on. And a lot of innocent people are going to be prosecuted and put in jail. Uh, a lot of, uh, of the uh, precepts of the Constitution are going to be put aside uh, in pursuit of, quote, what they call justice. Uh, for example, in many cases, you're presumed to be guilty until you go to court and prove yourself innocent. That's not the way it works here. In a court of law in the United States, you are presumed to be innocent until the state of Oklahoma or whatever state you're in proves you uh, guilty, uh, and then you're punished. Uh, but in cases like Sacco and Vanzetti, just the opposite was true. true. They were immigrants. They had heavy accents. They were anarchists. They were draft, draft dodgers. They had everything going against them uh, that you could have going against you in 1920s America. And, of course, I believe, and a lot of people, a lot of historians believe, uh, that they were sacrificial lands to this whole Great Red Scare, this whole fear that swept America, that communism was going to take over the world. They didn't look like the majority of the American people. They didn't talk like the majority of the American people. Uh, and so they're going to be put to death in 1927 for robbing an armored car. And to this day, that has never been proven that they did it. Somebody robbed that armored car, and somebody killed those policemen, those guards. But it has never, ever, ever been proven to be the Sacco, Sacco, and Vanzetti. They were executed for who they were, most people believe, uh, rather than for what they did. And of course, in all of this fear, get this down, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, is reborn. You know, the Ku Klux Klan, and I think I've said this to you before, they were on the way out. You might recall they were established in 1866, the year after the Civil War ended. Uh, they were, uh, their purpose was to uh, segregate America. Their purpose was to deny African Americans their constitutional rights. In other words, they said we may not have slavery anymore, but we're going to literally make these black people powerless. In other words, segregation uh, and denying them their constitutional liberties is the next best thing to slavery. We can't have slavery anymore, but we can have the next best thing to it. And by 1890, that was a fact. You had everything, uh, almost everything in America was segregated. Well, there's no more. And then in 1896, uh, the Supreme Court, what was the name of the case in which the U.S. government said segregation is now legal everywhere in America? What was the name of that case? <coughs> the Plessy case. Remember Plessy? Yeah, the, yeah, you remember that. The Plessy case. Uh, and so after 1896, is there a reason for the Klan? The answer is no. Black people have no rights. Everything's segregated. In 1896, the South feels like they've won the war. They got you know, they're running their own states, own rule. They think, you know, maybe we did win. So the membership of the Klan starts to drop. But then in 1915, a movie comes out called The Birth of a Nation. Uh, and then the 1920s, World War I happens, so you can't leave that out. Uh, great fear sweeps the country in the 1920s. The Ku Klux Klan is reborn, and the membership is going to go sky high. In fact, get this down, the 1920s is the greatest period of membership for the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan in their history. There's part right there of 250,000 of them marching down the streets of Washington, D.C. There you see the Capitol Dome in the background. 250,000 of them marching down the streets of Washington, D.C., uh, saying, essentially, we're back. We're here. Okay? And now, in addition, get this down to being anti-black, uh, they were now anti-communist. They've got all sorts of new causes to protect America from. To protect you from black people, anti-communist, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. All these groups, they said, are out to destroy America. You can't trust them. You can't trust them. By 1920, 
There were only 5,000 members of the Klan. By 1922, there were 200,000. And by 1925, there were 5 million. Which state do you think had the largest number of Klan members? Virginia. That's an educated guess, but that's not it. Any others? Georgia. What? Georgia. What did you say? Georgia. Well, that's an educated, that's not it. There Alabama. Are a lot of, huh? Alabama. Alabama. That's not it. <laughs> One more. North Carolina. That's not it. But that's an educated guess. <coughs> Indiana. What strike you all said southern states? What strikes you out about that? Indiana's a northern state. My point in that little thing there is to get this down. They were nationwide. They're no longer confined to the South. This state was a Klan state. In fact, they had enormous power in Oklahoma. In fact, at one time, the majority of members over in the Oklahoma State Legislature, that's the House and Senate over in Oklahoma City, may have been members of the Ku Klux Klan. They burned Jewish businesses. They burned Catholic churches. They murdered priests. They whipped priests. Uh, and, of course, all of these things that they did in addition to persecuting their uh, traditional target, African Americans. There was a young African American bellhop, you know, used to, and I guess today in the more fancier hotels, they used to, when you went in a hotel, they had a bellhop, usually it was a young man, a bellhop, and, uh, you know, you would check in and you'd have your luggage there, and when you'd sign, they would ring a little bell, and the bellhop would come out, and he would take your luggage up to your room, you'd give him a little tip, and he'd go on his way. Well, there was a young African American in Texas uh, in the 20s, and uh, he was, uh, he, he was a bellhop at a hotel, and when he got off work at the end of the day, he went down to the courthouse to see if he could register to vote. And they said, no, you can't register to vote. Who do you think you are? And he left. That night, he was abducted by the Klan, uh, and they uh, wrestled him down to the ground, uh, and they uh, burned uh, the initials KKK in his forehead with acid just for attempting to register to vote. And that's just one out of a jillion uh, episodes or examples I could give you. In both, to get this down, in, in both large cities and small towns, now the Klan became the protector of America from forces trying to destroy it. And I want you to write this down. The Klan also took it upon themselves to be the defenders of family values. Family values. That's a word you hear a lot in our politics today. Look, in the 20s, culture was changing, kind of like right now. Culture, they said, was changing too fast. Too many changes. There were things happening that people in the 1920s couldn't have imagined five years before. Kind of like right now. Uh, things were just too modern. So the Klan takes it upon themselves if they see it. You know, uh, the automobile had become pretty commonplace. And a young man would go get his girlfriend, and they would ride up and down Main Street. I assume that tradition still holds on Saturday night. Uh, but uh, the Ku Klux Klan literally whipped young women, young women uh, of all right, but young women, young white women especially, because they want to protect the sanctity and the purity of white women. It goes all the way back to the Civil War. But uh, who rode alone in a car with their boyfriend? Okay. You know, you, you, young lady, you get in the car with a young man, and you, you know, go across town. Um, when you, you return to, to your house, there might be four or five men with whips uh, and, and hoods, white hoods, standing in your front yard. Uh, they whip women for wearing their dresses too short. You're going to see that the dress code really changes. Uh, in 1914, when the troops were marching off, well, in 1917, when the American troops were marching off the war, the women's dresses went down to their ankles, okay? By the 1920s, I'll show you some pictures. By the 1920s, for the first time, you could see their legs. We always knew women had legs because they walked around, but you can see their legs. Uh, you know, the dresses are up to here. Very, very short dresses, okay? I don't know. I don't think they, they go to school here today without violating the dress code. Women show, and they wore these thin flimsy dresses, and they got whipped for it. Women were whipped for wearing too much makeup. 
Women were whipped for smoking and drinking in public. Teenagers were whipped if they skipped school. Sometimes their parents were whipped. If a kid skipped school, there would be a notice in the mailbox, Put your, get your child back in school, we're watching you, the KKK. If you didn't, uh, they would waylay you on a road somewhere uh, and whip you. Uh, if, your child, if your children drank or used tobacco or engaged in premarital sex, uh, you might get a thrashing from the Klan. And like I say, they are very powerful in Oklahoma. They lynch blacks. In Oklahoma, they lynch blacks and whites and Native Americans. Listen to these statistics. Between 1885 and 1930, there were 147 people lynched in the state of Oklahoma. 147 people lynched, black, white, and Native American. In the year of 1922, think about this, there were 2,500 whippings in the state of Oklahoma. Think about that. And Oklahoma also, get this down, had in the 1920s, uh, 50 sundown towns, 50 sundown towns. You know, uh, often in a community, the white community would decide, we don't want any more black people in this town. So they would stage a riot, and they would go over, and they would burn down the black section of town. And then they would make a rule. They would say, black people, you can come in, in town and work, but don't be here after sundown. You get out. If you're not, you're going to be in real trouble. And this says, don't let the sun set on your on you here. Understand, and everybody knew who that was pointing to. And signs like that were plastered up all over town. Here are some famous sundown towns. Henrietta, Oklahoma. Norman, Oklahoma. Durant. Ada, Bartlesville, Marlowe, they were all sundown towns. The Klan was so powerful and carried out, listen, carried out so many atrocities in the state of Oklahoma that we had a governor named Jack Walton, and on one occasion, he had to declare martial law. You know what martial law is? It's when the military takes over a state. He had to send out the National Guard and declare martial law law. And of course, eventually he's going to be impeached and removed from office. You remember that from your Oklahoma history, right? Jack Walton, the impeachment of Jack Walton. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, he was impeached for more than that, but still, uh, that's part of it. That's part of it. And of course, on May 31st, get this down, Tulsa. May, write this date down, May 31st, 1921, the Tulsa Greenwood Race Massacre. One of the, Greenwood is still there. Uh, a lot of money is being invested in Greenwood, and they hope to bring it up to its full, former glory. But in 1921, it was one of the wealthiest cities in America. Well, it was not a city on its own. It was a part of Tulsa. But get this down, it was called the Black Wall Street. One of the surviving things of uh, institutions, I should say, from Greenwood is Booker T. Washington. Have you ever been in any activities of Booker T. Washington High School? I think it's a math and science school. I think that's what it is. It's an honor school. But it goes all the way back <coughs> to uh, 1921 and Greenwood. They had a strong business community. They had a large professional class, teachers, attorneys at law, doctors. <clears throat> they had excellent schools, as I say. And on the morning of May 31st, 1921, a 19-year-old shoeshine boy named Diamond Dick Rowland, uh, that wasn't his real name. He was born Jimmy Jones in Benita, Oklahoma in 1903. He was orphaned. Uh, he was taken in by a woman named Dandy Ford, who later married a man named Dick Rowland, or Dave Rowland, and the boy took his name. So, so uh, Jimmy Jones became uh, Jimmy Rowland. And his nickname, I guess everybody had nicknames, his nickname was Diamond Dick, Diamond Dick uh, Rowland. And, um, you know, he was a student at Booker T, and he was a star football player there. Uh, and some people believe that he might play college football. And, of course, in those days, it would have had to have been in an all-black university. But he dropped out of high school. 
uh, to make money. Well, the Tulsa that he was in was strictly segregated. Uh, and uh, he, he worked in downtown, in the, quote, white section of Tulsa, downtown Tulsa. And the only restroom uh, available for African Americans was on the fourth floor of a building called the Drexel Building. Okay. And, uh, you know, black workers, there were also, every day, a large number of black people would leave Greenwood and they would go into White Tulsa to work, construction and all sorts of other things. And Dick Rowland would walk over and open up this shoeshine stand, okay? Well, uh, he got in the elevator about the middle of the morning. He went down to, uh, this is on the 20, 31st of May, he went to the Drexel building to use the restroom. And uh, there was an elevator operator who was a 17-year-old white girl named Sarah Page. And, she, you know, in those days, when you got on an elevator, there was a uniformed person there that held the door for you. In fact, in those days, first elevators, they had to open the door. They didn't do it automatic. And then they would say which floor, fourth floor, and they would punch the button, shut the door, and up you'd go. So they got in the elevator, and as he was going up, something happened. And, I mean, nobody knows what happened. Roland might have been leaving the elevator and stumbled and brushed his hand against her arm. Um, like I say, nobody knows, but something happened. He might have stepped on her foot, but she screamed, uh, and Roland ran, okay? Uh, and, of course, this incident ignited fears uh, among whites that went all the way back to the Civil War. Again, I've talked to you about this, I think, this old mythology that while all the white men were away, all the white brothers and fathers were away fighting war. Their white women were left in the middle of a hundred slaves, and the slaves just throughout the war continuously raped these poor women. And of course, none of that's true. There's not one documented case, not one, of a slave raping a white woman because her husband and sons were away fighting. It just doesn't exist. But that's a myth that holds on to this day, and it certainly was alive and well in 1921, a myth. Um, and so, Rowan was arrested, he ran, but they found him, <laughs> and he was arrested and taken to Tulsa County Jail. Now later, this white girl, Sarah Page, actually, she recanted, she wrote in a statement that for law, for, for court officials, I made it all up. Uh, and she really exonerated Rowan. Uh, and by the way, Paige, Sarah Page and Dick Rowland knew each other before this incident ever happened. They may have secretly dated. In fact, some people believe that they were planning to be married, which would have gone certainly against uh, Oklahoma's laws on interracial marriage uh, in 1921. And by the way, later on, the charges were going to be dropped against Dick Rowland. He was pronounced to be completely innocent, which he was. Uh, and she ends up really being a uh, a, a witness for him, okay, after all this starts. Well, three hours after this, quote, assault, and it wasn't an assault, but three hours after this assault, the Tulsa Tribune, no longer exists, okay, it's the Tulsa World, but the Tulsa Tribune, it became the Yellow Press, it became Facebook, and it headlined that a white woman had been assaulted by a black man. Did not happen. And a white mob gathered at the jail where Dick Rowland was being held. And of course, when that word spread through the black community that a young teenage boy was in the jail surrounded by armed whites, uh, these African Americans believed that they were going to lynch him. And so 75 African American men from Greenwood, many of them World War I veterans, some of them put on their old World War I uniforms, but they brought their guns. And there's just sort of a Standoff. The whites on the courthouse is here, whites on one side, and uh, uh, African Americans on the other. And uh, a white man tried to take a, a pistol away from a black man, and they got in a struggle, and the gun went off, uh, and shots are going to be fired, uh, and the crowd then disperses, and these whites decide we have got to put these black people in their place, and we have got to show them. Who rules Tulsa? And this mob uh, arms themselves. And the police are simply going to stand by and watch them as they storm into Greenwood and burn it to the ground and kill African Americans. 
They literally flew airplanes over Greenwood and bombed it from the air. <laughs> they burned down 35 square blocks of homes and businesses in Greenwood. And the numbers, how many were killed? Nobody knows. Three to 500, maybe. Uh, 800 wounded uh, in 24 hours. They burned 12 churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four pharmacies, eight doctor's offices, and 25 grocery stores, and a public library, and hundreds of homes in just 24 hours. Witnesses reported on the spot that bodies were hauled in wheelbarrows and dumped in the Arkansas, dumped in the Arkansas River. Mass graves. They're Right now, there's a big project in Tulsa. They're trying to get some sort of detector that they run across the ground. They're trying to determine, um, they find uh, mass, mass graves from the great race massacre. Of course, the sheriff is sort of a, and I don't want to read too much into this, but the sheriff is sort of a heroic figure here. The white sheriff, his name was Willard McCullough. The deputy sheriff, you know, to show you how really progressive Tulsa was, uh, the deputy sheriff was a black man named Barney Cleaver. He's one of the first uh, African-American lawmen in the state of Oklahoma, in the vast reach, but Barney Cleaver. And those two men, you know, sitting in the courthouse, they see this one, and they say, we're going to get Dick Rowland out of here. And they sneak him out of town and probably save his life. And like I say, Dick Rowland was eventually exonerated, no charges against him. Uh, and he went to St. Louis, and then he went to Oregon, and he died in Oregon in 1960. That he was working in a shipyard, and there was an explosion, and it killed him. Well, the National Guard, get this down, had to be called, and troops from Fort Sill, U.S. Army troops, had to be called in to restore order. A lot of people believe that the riot was pre-planned, that white merchants were just looking for a purpose or an excuse to destroy Greenwood, and the elevator incident was just made up. They had pre-planned that. Because a lot of the stores and businesses in Greenwood were much nicer than the ones in, quote, White Tulsa. And a lot of White Tulsans would go there. White merchants, this is one theory, white merchants felt they were losing business. Uh, and so they said, we're going to eliminate this and burn them down. The miracle of all of this is, the miracle of all of this is, is that after the Greenwood massacre, Greenwood was rebuilt. And it was a thriving community until the 1960s, uh, and it uh, uh, sort of entered into a state of decline, but as of late, 100th anniversary of Greenwood, 2021, just a couple of years ago, and there's been a re re renewed interest in the history of Greenwood and the town itself, and a lot of people are investing art galleries and all sorts of wonderful things are going up there. And by the way, on the 100th anniversary, there were uh, three survivors. One was named Viola Fletcher. She was 107. They would have all been small children at the time of the riot, but they witnessed it. Uh, Hughes Van Ellis was 800. He would have been an infant. And a woman named Leslie Randall was 106, okay? 106 years old. Well, and I want to say this as well. Get this down. The story doesn't end there. In the wake of this massacre, black and white Oklahomans banded together to break the power of the Klan. Uh, and they put pressure on the legislature. And in 1923, the state legislature, under pressure from both blacks and whites, passed an anti-mask law. Leading African Americans and leading white Americans, especially women, by the way, Women, if you study history, you will see they pretty much always take the lead in reform movements. But leading whites and African Americans formed organizations to defeat the Klan. You don't have to write these down, but one was called the Association of Southern Women Opposed to the Klan. Another was, these are all in Oklahoma. Another was called the Anti Ku Klux Klan All American Association. Another was called the Sons and Daughters of Liberty. And the message, from all of these organizations was clear. We do not wish to live under the tyranny of the Klan. By the way, the last lynching in Oklahoma took place in Chickasha, Oklahoma in 1930. 1930. I want you to also write this down about President Harding. You know, President Harding doesn't have a 
very good reputation. About every 10 years, uh, historians rate the presidents, and Harding's always down in the southern. I guess he's going to stay there. But get this down about Harding. He was a Republican. You know, and, and, and our friends in the Democrat Party have just about convinced the majority of people in this country that all Republicans, like me, hate all women, all minority groups, uh, all immigrants. We just hate them. Uh, and, and of course, as I've said to you many times, uh, you can get away with that lie if you're talking to people who don't know anything about the history of the Republican Party. Uh, I'll tell you who was the party of the Ku Klux Klan and the party of racism and segregation and states' rights in 1920, and for a long time afterwards, it was the Democrat Party. And the Republican Party was the Liberal Party, that word we hate in Oklahoma, the Liberal Party, and it was the party of civil rights, okay, for a hundred years before Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King's father was a Republican. Martin Luther King, what is that? Oh, yeah. Use County. Messiah Moore, Black Male, age 10. 10 months. Oh, sorry. Not 10, age 10 months. Child infection. Okay. Martin Luther King was a Republican. Now, later on, he became an independent, but he was a Republican. Warren Harding was president. Well, Harding, I like Harding. No, he's not a great president. But uh, he was a Republican. He's the first Republican of this trio that ruled in the 1920s. And he spoke out as well, get this down, about the Tulsa race massacre. And in 1921, that was a courageous thing to do for a president. Less than a month after this race riot, Harding was invited. It was May. You know, we're in May. This is the month of graduation. I've got about three to go to next week. And Harding was invited as the commencement speaker at the Lincoln University. And Lincoln University was an all-black university. Today it's integrated, but it was called the Black Princeton. Okay? It was uh, uh, an absolutely... Starving, you could get a starving education day in Lincoln, Pennsylvania, and he delivered the commencement address. And he said that riots like the one that happened in Tulsa would never happen again. And by the way, he's going to send an anti lynching bill to the Congress. The Congress is going to vote it down. The Congress is going to vote it down. But right after this speech at Lincoln University, in Pennsylvania, he'll go down to Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Birmingham, Alabama. If you know anything about the modern day civil rights, Martin Luther King, uh, Birmingham, Alabama was at the crux of the Klan and racism uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s and even the 1970s. Well, he goes down there in the 1920s. You can imagine how bad it was then. And he said this to an all white audience about in Alabama, and I quote, he said, I believe that Negro citizens should be guaranteed the full enjoyment of all rights. Their sacrifice in blood on the battlefields of this republic have entitled them to all of the freedom and opportunity that the American spirit of fairness and justice demands. He said, if black Americans are denied political equality, that's a pretty strong statement. He said, if black Americans are denied political equality, he said, then American, uh, uh, excuse me, American democracy is a lie, is a lie, end, end quote. Which takes us now to the presidential election of 1920. Let this happen. presidential election of 1920. I've already mentioned a little bit, but we're going to look at it in detail. Um, well, by 1920, Woodrow Wilson's in a wheelchair. He's dying. What time is this over? 9.30. Oh, good. 9.30? 10 10 30. 10 30. Oh, my watch is going. Who said 9.30? Put your head down. You've learned enough. Go out and check the sun. Okay. 
But well, I got this enough from right, By 1920, the country was tired of saying Woodrow Wilson with the great progressive who was out to save the world. And now we take a turn toward isolationism. The Democrats get this down, nominated this. Whoops. There's a horrible lynching. There's three dead men. Postcard. I think mean, maybe I've shown you some of these before. But this is in the 20s. There's Greenwood a Church burning. And there it is from the air. They literally bombed that with airplanes. And there are African Americans being rounded up and taken to jail. And there's a couple of guys coming out with shotguns over their arms. And there's a guy escorting three ladies down so they can see the fun. And there's Lucille Figures. Uh, and there's, I've shown you this, I think. There's Dr. I can't think of her name, but she was at Fordham University. Uh, so, in 1920, here are the Democrats. Uh, you don't have to worry about writing down James Cox, nobody ever heard of him, but write down the vice presidential candidate, who's the vice, it's 1920, who's the vice presidential candidate? Franklin Roosevelt. And I want you to write this down, FDR is the star of this campaign. He wasn't very well known outside of New York. There he is, young man, and there he is campaigning with cops. And he's the star. He's the star of this campaign. He was the cousin of Teddy, but his branch of Roosevelt's were Democrats. And here's what the Democrats stood for. Get this down. They said, if you elect us, we will join the League of Nations. We will join the League of Nations. We stand for the Treaty of Versailles. We stand for the Treaty of Versailles. In other words, we'll carry out Woodrow Wilson's program. I think you know why they lost. America's tired of Woodrow Wilson's program. So Roosevelt goes on to lose, but he makes a real impression. People look at him and say, someday that guy's going to be president of the United States. Well, guess what? In 1932, he will be elected, and he'll be elected four times. Okay, four times. Right after this campaign, he was tired. The Roosevelt's were sea people. They liked to go to the beach and the ocean. They went up to Campobello, which is in Canada. That's where their family vacations were. And they were swimming. And uh, one night, they, Eleanor, his wife, got the children together. She was going back up to this place with the cottage or whatever they were saying. Is. Roosevelt just sat out there. Maybe he'd done this at the cove. He just sat with his legs in the water, kind of let the waves lap up over his legs. And while he's sitting out there, uh, well, well, I got ahead of myself. Rewind just a minute. He goes to Camp Abella, and while he's there, get this down, he's camp, he, he and his aides are planning, he and his aides are planning for the election of 24. They say, Frank, you can win at 24. All right? We'll get back to the beach in a minute. So they're, and they're a group of Boy Scouts just down the road having an encampment. One of his aides said, Frank, y'all go down there and have lunch with those Boy Scouts. And Roosevelt said, I don't want to go down with those Boy Scouts. Yeah, I go, have your picture made. They're all going back home. They're going all over the country. And when their parents say to them when they get home, how the summer camp, all they'll be able to talk about, hey, we met that guy that ran for vice president in 1920. So that's the best free campaign publicity you'll ever get. Well, okay, I'll get out there. There he is. That's the last picture of him standing up on his own. Right there. There he is. Because one of those little Boy Scouts, or maybe more, had a deadly virus. It's called poliomyelitis. Polio. Write that down. Polio. Now you don't have to worry about that because, by the way, who came up with the polio vaccine that you have to take before you come to school? Who was the winning quarterback in last year's Super Bowl? One that just happened. One that just happened. Um, Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes. Does it say anything about our values in this country that you can name to me? 
the man who won a little boy's game called football, and you don't know the name of the man who developed the polio vaccine in the 1950s and to save millions and millions and continue to this day to save millions of lives. Anything wrong with that? I don't know. I don't know. It's very important. Yeah. Doctor, just for the record, Doctor, yeah, you have to Unless you want to, Dr. Jonas Salk, S A L K, came up with the polio vaccine before Patrick Mahomes was born. You know why, Patrick? You know, it's a good chance Patrick Mahomes is in a wheelchair because it's the Dr. Jonas Salk. But forget him. Football. Yeah. Well, anyway, Jonas Salk hadn't done that yet. He goes home. The family's out on the beach. I'm going to hold you over there. The family's out on the beach. He's sitting there just letting the water lap over his legs, and he gets a little chill. So he goes up to the house, and he neck's kind of stiff. When he gets to the house, they're all eating, and his wife, Eleanor, says, your dinner is in the oven. And he said, you know, I'm kind of pissed. I think he's got the flu. He said, I'm going to go try and sleep it off. He goes upstairs, takes off his clothes, lays down, and he never took another step. The next morning, he wakes up, and he's paralyzed from the middle of his chest on down. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You think we would elect a man or a woman in a wheelchair as president today? I think you're right, and I hate to say that. Why? What would we say about it? What? They're too weak. They're too weak. Roosevelt was elected four times. He got us through, you could argue, the two greatest crises in American history. Number one, the Great Depression. And number two, that whole thing called World War II. I'd say that's pretty good. Anybody since Roosevelt face crisis like that? Nope. Nope. We think we're on the edge, about to drop off, but no. This is nothing. You better be glad your sophomores in high school in May of 2023. You got it May instead of May of 43. Yeah. And Roosevelt got us through all that. <coughs> well, the Republicans, so so anyway, and that's in 1920. One, get this down. And everybody said he's finished. A man in a wheelchair could not be elected. So Roosevelt has to convince the American people he can walk. And I'm going to show you him walking by himself. And he's walking just like this. I'm going to show you him. But he's not walking. He's the great actor. But he convinced the American people he can walk. And in 1932, 11 years after this, he is the President of the United States. Four times in a row. The Republicans nominated Harding. And I want you to write this down. Harding, and I'm not even going to explain it. You see it on the test, just remember this, and I'll explain it when we have lecture again. But Harding was called the candidate, and I'll go into detail on this, the candidate of the smoke-filled room. Your test will go down to there. Anybody need a note? Notes? Oh, you're going to advise me.